Hey there, I'm Nev Miz, and I like to make games. Just recently, I read a book called Flatland, a fantasy partially set in a fully two-dimensional world. The book explores what it would be like to actually live on a 2D plane, the physics and challenges of such an existence, and scathing social commentary about Victorian England? Huh. Anyway, I got pretty inspired by this book, and set out on the admittedly kind of silly endeavor of creating a 2D game which you play in first person. Okay, first off, what does it even mean for a 2D game to be in first person? Well, when we think of 2D games, two perspectives usually come to mind. Side view and top-down games. Side view is what you usually see in platformers. Your character can move freely left and right, and when you jump up, you're pulled back down by gravity. Top-down is often used in dungeon crawlers or roguelikes. Here, your character can move freely, both horizontally and vertically and gravity doesn't affect it. But something important to note about these types of games is they're not really two-dimensional. The player's view, in both these perspectives, exists outside the plane of the game, something that can only happen in 3D space. A good way to visualize this is by imagining that the game is happening on a piece of paper. You're looking at this paper from a different point in 3D space, outside the plane of the paper. If you were a 2D character on that paper, you wouldn't be able to see the entire page like you can from the outside. But what would you see? Luckily, Flatland provides us with an excellent explanation of this exactly. Imagine a coin placed on a table. Now picture yourself lowering your head more and more until it's perfectly in line with the table. As your viewpoint gets closer and closer to the plane of the table, you can see the coin flattening more and more, becoming an ellipse before finally becoming nothing more than a straight line. This is similar to what a flatlander would see, a straight line with different shapes on the page appearing as differently or more brightly colored strips on that line. Okay, so now that we understand what a first person view should look like in two dimensions, let's try to approach the problem of actually rendering it. I immediately thought of a technique I'd heard about for rendering 3D objects using only mathematical formulae called ray marching. In this system, we shoot out a ray from the camera for each pixel on the screen. The ray steps forward until it detects it's inside an object, and when it is, it colors the corresponding pixel. We also have to limit the number of steps a ray can take, so we don't encounter an infinite loop if the player is staring into empty space. Simple enough, right? But it gets interesting when we look into how you detect that a ray is inside an object. In order to do this, we need to use something called a sign distance function. Sign distance functions, or SDFs, are functions that each describe the distance between a point and a given shape, such that if the point is outside the shape, the distance is positive, but if the point is inside the shape, the distance will be negative. Here's an example. This is the sine distance function for a circle. It returns the distance between the point we're checking and the center of the circle, minus the radius of the circle. As you can see, the value is positive when the point is outside the circle, it's equal to zero when the point is on the circumference, and most importantly, it's negative when the point is inside our circle. Using this, we just check the sine distance from every shape in the scene on each step of our ray, and if one of those distances is negative, we know we're inside a shape, and we should color the pixel. There are sine distance functions for a ton of shapes, and using ray marching allows us to render every single one of them with no extra cost of performance or level design. As you can imagine, ray marching works perfectly well in 2D. Depending on how many pixels we want our screen to have, we send out a line of rays, taking small steps and checking if they're inside one of our 2D shapes on each one. We render the output to the screen and boom, an accurate render of a first-person view of a circle in two dimensions. This is admittedly pretty boring though. It is, after all, just a white line between two black lines. If we could move around, it might feel like we're actually in this world. So I threw together a simple first-person character controller for 2D. Funnily enough, it was almost identical to a very basic 3D FPS controller, at least as far as the code goes. The only two major differences were the lack of jumping, obviously, and the lack of vertical camera rotation. This controller allowed me to move around the white circle, and I think something interesting to note is how the line seems to stretch and get longer as it gets closer to the edge of the screen. This is actually an effect that happens in 3D too and it has to do with the camera's field of view. 
If you play any FPS games, you probably know that the higher your field of view is, the wider your view, but you also get more warping at the edges of your screen. In our 2D example, we actually get a really good visual explanation of this phenomenon. As you can see, because of how we cast our rays, as the object gets closer to the edge of the screen, it becomes denser with points, meaning more rays are detecting it, and so more pixels on screen are coloring accordingly. Next I wanted to add support for different shapes. This is very easy in theory, because like I said, there are tons of sine distance functions online for basically any shape you could ever need to render, so just plugging these functions in should show the shapes perfectly. And it does, except because we're viewing it in first person, we can't actually tell the difference between a square and a circle. From this perspective, they're both just straight lines. Luckily, Flatland has a solution for this too. In the book, there's a very thick fog surrounding everything. But how could that help you differentiate between shapes? See, in real life, when we need to determine the depth of an object, or how far away the object is, our brains figure it out intuitively, using perspective. But because here, our view is only one-dimensional, we don't have perspective to help us, and so we'll need to find another way to tell the depth of objects. This is where the fog comes in. As things get farther away from the camera, they fade out into darkness. So when looking at a square from one of its vertices, the vertex will be at full brightness, but the sides will fade off and become darker. This fills the role of perspective, because now we can tell how far away something is by just looking at how bright or dark it is, and we can tell if we're looking at a circle or a square by rotating around it and trying to find a vertex. The way I implemented fog was super simple thanks to the ray marching algorithm. Depending on how many steps the ray took to collide with an object, I interpolate the actual output color from the shape's color to the fog color. At nearly no extra cost to performance, we made a really nice fade effect that's also crucial if we want to be able to actually understand what we see on screen. We now have a pretty convincing first-person 2D renderer. I can't help but wonder what Edwin Abbott, the author of Flatland, would think if he saw the world he came up with, which he could only imagine, come to life like this. I think it's amazing that we can just create an entire world like this in such a short time today. It really is a testament to how powerful these tools are and how far math has come. Really quick, I wanted to mention that if you want access to the source code of this project, or any future coding experiments like this that I make, please consider supporting me on Patreon. You get early access to games I'm working on, the source code for a bunch of my projects, a mention at the end of my videos, and in general it's just the absolute best way to support me. Back to the video. We have a big problem though, performance. Currently, every frame, we're looping once through every ray we cast out from the camera, another time to go through each of the steps we take along each ray, and lastly, we loop through all of the objects in the scene to find out if our ray is inside one of them. That's three nested loops every single frame. To give you an example of how hard our poor CPU is working at the moment, let's imagine we want to cast out 100 rays from the camera for a resolution of 100 pixels have each ray step forward a maximum of 20 times, and we have 10 shapes in the scene. That's already 20,000 operations per frame, all to render just a simple line. I normally wouldn't worry too much about performance for a little project like this, but this number was pretty absurd. Plus I thought this was a good opportunity to learn a bit about compute shaders. Essentially, compute shaders are a way to speed up calculations like these by offloading some of the work to the GPU. This improves performance because while the CPU is very good at doing complex calculations in sequence, the GPU specializes in doing many smaller calculations in parallel. So instead of looping over every ray we want to cast, we'll just shoot them all out at the same time. This is of course simple enough in theory, but in practice it was a little harder to implement. It took me multiple tries and much frustration to even just get the output from the compute shader to render onto the screen, and that only compounded as I tried to port all the ray marching logic over. When I finally got a single circle rendering to the screen, I was so excited, but it was a little tough to get my friends and family to share in the excitement, considering all I had to show for it was a white line on a black background. I finished porting all the code over to the compute shader, and I definitely did see an improvement in performance, especially when using a higher resolution and shooting out more rays. Though I'm sure it could be much higher, and my code isn't as optimized as it could be. Now that we've optimized the rendering, we have another problem. When moving towards a triangle or a square from the vertex, it looks as expected. Slowly growing line, darkening at the edges. But when we look at the corners of one of these shapes from a different angle and start moving around, we're seeing some weird flickering. Why is that? Well, the method I was using for ray marching up until now was the most basic form of it. 
we step forward along each ray at a constant distance for some number of steps and check at each step for an intersection with a shape. But the problem with this approach is that sometimes, if a shape is thin enough, or alternatively, we're looking at a sharp point of some shape, the ray can sometimes skip over the part of the shape that it should have intersected with. This is what caused the flickering at the edges of the triangle and square before. As we moved around, the rays we cast from the camera sometimes skipped over the shape's vertex. The fix for this problem is using something called distance-aided ray marching. In this approach, the length of the steps we take along the ray isn't fixed, but dynamic. Each step is equal to the length of the distance from the point we're currently on to the nearest shape. We can check for collisions by checking if our step size is equal to zero. With this approach, we never skip over any shapes or corners, because the rays are dynamically adjusting their steps to hit the shape closest to them. The only small sacrifice we need to make with this method is the fog. Instead of being able to calculate it based on what step of the ray we're on, we need to find the exact distance of the ray collision point to the camera, and use that to interpolate between the shape and the fog colors. This is a bit more computationally expensive, but it's not a great loss in the grand scheme of things, and the engine finally looks right now. Now, the line we're rendering obviously has some height to it, and isn't infinitely thin. This of course means it's not 100% accurate to what a flatlander would see, but considering humans can't see infinitely thin lines, I think this compromise is better than the alternative. What I find very interesting though, is what happens when I scale the height of the canvas up a bit. The visual this creates is super cool in my opinion. It almost seems like it's a 3D scene where there's no floor and you're floating around next to some pillars of various shapes. When you really think about it, our brain is doing some pretty insane gymnastics to get to this point. We're viewing a two-dimensional world with a one-dimensional view on a two-dimensional screen in a three-dimensional world through a two-dimensional viewpoint, and somehow we can still make sense of it and really be immersed in this world. Just so we have something to do in this flat world, I added a system for shooting little orange bullets and some collision detection, which also uses our handy sign distance functions so they can do some damage and destroy the shapes they touch. If you guys like this concept, I might expand on it a little and make it into an actual game with some goals, but for now I'm really quite happy with this tiny little renderer. It's very simple visually, but when you know what's going on under the hood, I think it's pretty interesting and a fun concept to think about. Thanks for getting so far in the video. This one was a lot longer than my previous devlogs, but I really enjoyed making it. I think I'll continue making these types of more miscellaneous projects that I find interesting for a while before starting my next big commercial project, so definitely subscribe if you're into this type of content. Also, if you want to look at the source code for this project, check out my Patreon. Let me know in the comments what you think about this little experiment, plus if you think I should expand it into a real game for you guys to play. And if you think it could work as a game, drop any ideas you have to add to it. Till next time, see ya.